Build Right is the educational division of Sparkbox, working to inspire and empower a web built right. For more information about Build Right or to have one of our workshops at your company or event, check out buildright.io. If you'd like to have Sparkbox help you make your web better, visit csparkbox.com. You're watching Ethan Marcotte's Build Right Maker Series on Responsive Web Design from November 5th of 2015. The Build Right Maker Series is brought to you by the folks at Sparkbox and these generous sponsors. DataYard, performance-driven cloud hosting for kick-ass websites and applications. Campaign Monitor, a simple and elegant email marketing software for business. Shopify a hosted, theme-based e-commerce platform. Harvest, simple time tracking, professional invoicing, powerful reporting software. Additional thanks to our secondary and giveaway sponsors for their help in making the Build Right Maker Series possible. Um, so scrolling and parallax websites, good, bad, maybe. Uh, you asking me like personally as a designer or just like from a technical? Good for the web. Uh, uh, pass, no, um, I guess I, what I'll say is like, I don't think I've ever seen, I can't think of a parallax interface that I felt like solved a problem. Like I can't, I can't think of a particular piece of content or a particular interface that was actually made better by having parallax in front of it. Um, I've seen some very subtle ones, uh, that I feel like those are probably the most like thoughtful applications, but. Like I'm, I'm having trouble like thinking of a, a particular instance of parallax where I was like, this feels right, you know? Um, yeah, yeah. So that's I think that's that's where I'll land. Is like, yeah, can't can't think of it. Like I don't think it's bad, but I haven't seen it solve a particular problem or communicate something more effectively. So yeah, thank you. Sure. Yeah. <laughs> Make sure you include the part where I said it wasn't bad. <laughs> so uh, just personally, obviously this is regularly changing as, as the technology changes, but um, just for you, what, is, what project are you most proud of that you've worked on? Oh, wow, yeah. Um, and, and why? Yeah. Um, uh, I got three. Um, the Boston Globe was one of the best projects I've ever worked on. I mean, it was like, that was a client that understood um, the benefits of designing for mobile, um, that they just had like from the top down, they just kind of rallied around this idea of like we need to be, we need to broadcast as widely as possible. And responsive design was like something to let them do that. Um, so everything, every challenging part of that project, like from uh, embedded media, advertising, um, even something as simple as like type direction on devices that didn't support web fonts. There's never an argument that, you know, well, we have to make this work because, you know, what, whatever. It was like, okay, well, this is the reality of the web we're working on. Let's, let's figure out the best possible option here. Um, and it was just, it was a fun project, and it was really great to kind of like figure out responsive design at that scale the first time. Um, it was a great project. Uh, second one is the one I just mentioned that just launched the Toast. Um, just an amazing client. Like, and I, both the Globe and the Toast, it was like I wasn't a reader, a regular reader, before I actually worked on those sites. And meeting the people and just sort of figuring out some of the stories that they were telling, like that was that was really gratifying. And so it just kind of got me hooked on both of them uh, from there. And the other one um, was a project that is never going to launch, I'm afraid. Uh, something I worked on about a year and a half ago for a large retailer. It was going to be basically like a web-based, responsive version of their native app that they use for like in-store purchases and stuff like that and in-store payment systems. And so they were coming up with a responsive web application that had to work offline. It was going to be deployed in developing markets. So it had to be fast, it had to be flexible, and um, had to be offline friendly, which has a whole bunch of like really interesting UX constraints around it. Because it's not about like a, if you're working on a web front end that you're trying to make accessible offline, it's not about just like shutting off the whole UI. It's about thinking about like what parts of the UI are going to be functional in a no network situation. What are you communicating to the end user at those points? Um, how are you going to be syncing back up when you actually do have a data connection? So that was like, I don't know. It could have easily just been like a dry technical challenge, but it actually had a lot of really interesting design problems kind of around it, and it was it was really fun. Um, I wish it was going to launch, uh, but oh well. Um, yeah, thanks. That's a great question. Yeah. 
Um, so from a, uh, I guess I don't, I don't really know how to phrase this question. Uh, it, wh where's a good place to start when it, when it comes to adjusting scope due to like budget constraints? Yeah. And then w like what, what's like a cutoff point where you're just like, sorry, like I can't sacrifice like this much and still like deliver a product that I'm proud of? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, I don't know if I've ever had that kind of walk away moment, you know, where I've had to sort of like say that I can't ship this thing. Um, that's not to say I've never been frustrated on a project before, but it's like um, every project involves some sort of compromise and constraint is sometimes one of the best things that can happen to a design, sometimes. Uh, sometimes it's not. But I guess it's like, um, I was talking to somebody last night, I was talking to Ben last night about like some of my, I, I sort of had a brief detour into some product design work for a few years and part of my brain wasn't quite adjusted from like the variety and churn of client work moving into something that was gonna be like, I was gonna be working on this one interface for two years, two plus years. And um, I had to figure out how to make that interesting to me, um, kind of given the, the different pace of it. And there were a lot of constraints in product work, but I guess looking for those opportunities to kind of like force your brain to be delighted, I guess even in the face of something that might not necessarily be ideal, like how can you make that problem kind of interesting to you and absent that? Um, uh, it was kind of a hallmarky response to your question, which I think is a really big one, but um, that's kind of where I've had to land. Like, all right, this one thing's been kind of taken away that I was really kind of excited about. What's the next best thing available to me? Um, yeah, so that's, that's where I'm gonna land, I think. It's a great question, thank you. So has responsive design had any unintended consequences? Uh, like, oh, it's a great idea, but oh, I wish you hadn't done that with it. Yeah. Have you, have you had any of those moments? Uh, I mean, you know, I joke about like missing the old days where I was just focusing on like, you know, designing for a very slim view of the web, but there was something really appealing about constraint and knowing or feeling like you know a lot of your parameters for working. So I think that's part of the appeal for some people about like native app development, whether desktop or mobile, it's like you can kind of eliminate a lot of variables. You're introducing a whole bunch more, but like there's something comforting at least for me about like, okay, I, I know I only have to worry about this. Um, but beyond that, it's like, I don't know, I like a lot of the problems that kind of happen. The, the worst thing about the web is kind of the best thing about the web is just how unpredictable it is. And uh, I'm never bored, I will say that. And uh, yeah, I can't imagine doing anything else. Thank you, that's a great question. For sites that aren't yet responsive, yeah, um, does it make sense at some point to retrofit it versus redesign it, and how do you choose? That's a great question. Um, I think um, like retrofit versus some sort of implementation strategy, like that's that's got to be paired to the organization. Um, I've worked with a lot of organizations and talked to a lot of organizations where they've gone for. Um, the sort of strategic, small scope, responsive design, like a fresh responsive design, but it's in a relatively low traffic or low impact version of the site, part of the site. Um, and then they can make that responsive, they can get some data on how well that's performing, they can figure out what their process issues were during that process, and then sort of deploy a little bit widely. Like that's what the BBC did and the Guardian did, like with their responsive mobile only sites. You could be Microsoft and just be like, screw it, I'm redesigning my homepage to be responsive. And everything after that was just fixed width. But what that allowed them to do was actually get a lot of interest from other parts of the organization in responsive design. It was really visible, it was probably pretty risky, but it's, it's, it was beautiful work when it first launched and that sold it internally. So, and then yeah, retrofits are totally valid. Um, you know, that uh, Capital One, they basically were told you can't touch the desktop experience. Like this is working well for us. This is kind of our sacred cow, I guess, uh, to botch a phrase. <coughs> and uh, so they, they really had to go for a retrofit approach, but then that, I think that basically helped them make a case for doing it, doing a fuller redesign at some point, you know, because it did highlight a lot of content issues. Um, so there's no one true approach. I think it's really about what's going to be most tactically appropriate for your organization. Um, and again, to plug Karen's book that's going to be coming out next month, Going Responsive, it's going to talk about some of those different strategies. It's, it's good stuff. Thank you, that's a great question. If you're using a, module, a pr modular approach on a, on a project, yeah. how early in the design process are you thinking about modules and 
what's your approach as far as like how far to abstract out and, and things yeah. like that? Yeah, yeah. I'm so glad you asked that question. <laughs> um, I can't. I can't start. I can't start in a modular level. Like, um, I can. I can start uh, like in a broad level. Like, I, if I know like the content model that I'm working from and the content types, I can start coming up with some sort of sketch. Um, but uh, at least for me, um, the design language needs to be formal enough where I can start actually looking for those opportunities to consolidate patterns, to break things out a little bit more. Um, so I can't, I can't just like grab you know, some sort of off-the-shelf framework and start defining my modules if I don't know what the content is or what the layout's going to be. Um, and the process for the Toast was kind of similar. We, we tried to get the design to a point and then figure out where things could be consolidated or collapsed, where we could maybe gain some efficiency there and then, then come up with a pattern library. But I think everyone's got their own approach for that. So I need to see the big picture still. Pretty much every other like, uh, design discipline, they, they start talking about modular design when they get to a certain point of maturity. Um, you know, architecture, uh, fine art. Um, I was reading about shipping design recently. So I mean, it's like, uh, you know, I think we're just getting to this point now where we can start having these conversations. We figured out the, like the big level layout stuff, and now we can start talking about the problems underneath them. So I have a book about uh, pattern design coming out next month uh, that I've, I've been thinking about with this a lot. But um, I don't think there's a right way to start the process. It's really about what you're most comfortable with. Thank you. Thank you. That was a great question. So you talked about working through the post-it note exercise with clients. Um, yeah. What are some other exercises that you find yeah. valuable to work through? Yeah. Um, a lot of them are variations on that. Um, one that I was just reading about, and I've used a slightly different version, is um, getting a printout of a web page, usually from their site, and giving everyone a whole bunch of scissors and just cutting it up. And then basically, like, that re doesn't require folks like actually scribing down names of pieces of m content. They can actually just really start building a small screen layout kind of from the outset. Um, and uh, I find that's a little bit more fun, a little bit more arts and crafty than, uh, than the post note approach. Um, and I've also used something like that, um, or there was, a, there was an article in the list of part that came out just yesterday or the day before by uh, Charlotte Jackson who works at Clear Left, and she was talking about how they use that to get people thinking about you know, pattern-driven design so they can actually take a design that's more or less been, excuse me, approved and finished, and then have the client kind of cut things up and uh, identify them, like label them. Like this is a head, this is a subhead, this is a button, this is a button of a certain class and then using that to stitch them together into, okay, well, this module has these components in it, we're gonna call this a brick or something. But it, it takes a little bit of the ambiguity out of what kind of weird nebulous metaphor do we wanna use for this and actually helps the entire team kind of like define and organize their patterns and hopefully helps them maintain it a little bit better in the long run. Um, so those are the two big ones right now kind of front of mind. Thank you. Uh, hey, Ethan. Um, <clears throat> I have two questions, but I'm sure there are uh, going to be short answers. First one is, are you, um, would you be available for us to reach out to you in case we need support in our projects or have questions to you or with our clients and stuff like that? And the other question is, um, what in your experience, you, since you're a very experienced web professional, where do you see the newcomers to uh, this industry struggle the most when it comes to talk about responsive? Uh, uh, so to answer your first question, um, yeah, everyone in the room is invited to email me anytime, uh, you know, or hit me up on Twitter, um, and I'm always available for hire. But um, uh, yeah, no, I, I love hearing what people are working on and stuff like that. I'm, I get a ton of email, so if I don't respond right away, it's because I'm a bad person. It's not because of you. So, uh, so, um, but yeah, no, I'd love to hear from you folks. If you guys have any questions or anything I didn't cover today. You can either let me know now or just drop me a line anytime. Um, yeah. Um, second part was, could you just say uh, that one more time? What do, what do you see the newcomers into the industry, web designers, web developers, front end, UI, UX <coughs> professionals that are coming new into the industry that struggle the most when it comes to understanding responsive design and all the concepts around it? Because we throw all these terms around. Sure. Media queries. Uh, Responsive images, so yeah. do you touch an image? Do they think you touch an image and the thing responds and jumps at you? You know what I'm saying? Yeah. We have these concepts very clear, but the new people may not really get those concepts sure. necessarily. Um, 
I think in many ways, like I've, I've been speaking to a lot of college classes in the last couple years and design students and um, I feel like in a lot of ways like people entering the industry are in better shape than I am because they're not kind of saddled by this kind of like desktop first view of the web like I have been historically. So in a lot of ways, like they're, they're in better shape to start thinking a little bit more flexibly because cross device design is just kind of like what they've grown up in. Um, so that's been kind of exciting to see. I think the one thing that um, I do hear frequently, and this is something I hear from my clients, and this is something I've always struggled with, that, that like mobile tablet desktop sort of division, you know, that you're thinking about, you know, these, um, these really broad terms that don't necessarily speak to what mobile means, you know, at a global level. Um, so breaking those down and sort of working with them on de design exercises to kind of get past some of those default assumptions, like, and again, I don't think that's a newcomer-specific problem. I think that's an industry-specific uh, challenge in front of us right now. Yeah, thank you. It's a great question. Hi. Hi. Um, besides architecture, where else do you find inspiration for functionality and design? Wow, yeah. Functionality and design. Um, I mean, graphic design in general. Um, uh, there's this uh, Swiss designer in the middle of the 20th century called Gerstner, who it's it's weird because like I, I sort of set up a lot of the responsive design stuff is like we need to move past print, um, but in a lot of ways like print designers have been solving a lot of these problems for centuries. You know, thinking about how a design system needs to adapt to different sizes of media. And uh, let me see if I have an example of his. Uh, his design work on here because really it's um, it's stunning stuff. Um, thinking about you know how you can come up with like um, you know like brand essence for example or like some sort of branding system that can actually like move from you know one kind of media to another, one shape of media to another. Um, let's see here. Yeah. Okay. I love this stuff. You know, so he's, he's thinking about these design frameworks that are reusable, that they're comprised of many smaller components, and they need to be adapted in different ways. And he did a ton of branding work that ha also had to adapt in certain ways. And so what his solution for this was, was he, he basically tried to argue that designers contemporary to him need to step back from layout and actually argue that we need to be designing not solutions for problems from the outset, but systems or frameworks, as we might call them, to support many different kinds of solutions that you can't actually anticipate. Um, there is always a group of solutions, one is which always is the best under certain conditions. Um, and the kind of like famous example of this, uh, and this might be evidence that Carl Gerstner was not very much fun at parties, was this thing that he called uh, the morphological typogram. Really rolls off the tongue which is basically a system that allowed him to come up with um, a whole host of different iterations on word marks or brands, uh, branding uh, variations for clients. And basically what he did was he sort of decided at the outset, at some point, every logo has four different characteristics. And he called them, um, you know, uh, basis, color, appearance, and expression. And underneath each one of those, uh, he came up with these sort of subcategories and each one of those subcategories had all these different possible permutations. Yeah, I'm, I'm sure when he walked into like a cocktail hour, just people just scattered. But, you know, so basically like every typeface, for example, that he could possibly use would be broken up into sans serif, into Roman, into German, you know, some other or some combination of those. Looks kind of terrifying. But what this allowed him to do was basically kind of like quickly iterate over different combinations of these characteristics. So he could just kind of look at the grid and sort of highlight some things that he thought might be kind of interesting and then experiment with them. Um, so it'd be very e easy for him to kind of mix characteristics to uh, you know, come up with this, uh, different versions of this intermobile uh, version uh, mo mark that he came up with for a client. So this is where that kind of approach on designing a framework to support further design is kind of interesting to me. And um, thinking about the design principles that you hold dear as a designer, is, uh, is kind of cool. So, anyway, yeah, thank you. That's a great question. Yes, um, so obviously you've been a big part of the way that web development has changed and changed the minds of uh, all us developers and, and thinking responsibly. What is it about developing that you're most passionate about? Like what gets you most excited about it when you, when you wake up and, and you start jumping in? Yeah, huh. Uh, no, that's a great question. I think, um, 
You're very kind, first of all. I think if somebody, if I hadn't coined responsive design, I think somebody would have because like we couldn't have just kept doing what we were doing, I think, like just designing device specific experiences didn't scale. Um, the thing I'm most excited about is like, and it sounds n nerdy, but it's like having discussions with clients about what happens when their design fails in some way. You know, and uh, you know, we mentioned progressive enhancement before, but like that actually could have like an impact on a branding system that a client designs. Like we decided that these typefaces are core to our messaging. Okay, well, what happens if those don't actually communicate or actually reach the end user? Like, what is the branding system going to look like independent of those typefaces? Um, and that has like specific implementation stuff for like more technical components of a UI. But like, I like talking about failure from a design standpoint. Like, that's that's interesting to me. Um, like, what happens when our design breaks? If if I'm working on it, it's probably going to break because I'm not very good at things. Um, but like, if the network fails on us, like, what does that do? Um, I like that stuff. Thank you. That's a great question. Thank you. Thank you. Um, well, just a sidebar. I was actually at your talk, of an apart talk in Seattle in 2010 that oh, you no mentioned. Kidding. So, oh, great. Yeah, I thought that was kind of cool. Well, thanks for coming um, out. So I was actually at an event apart earlier this week, too. Oh, um, all right. In San Francisco. I, yeah. Nice, nice. Yep. I saw Rachel Andrew, and she talked yep. about CSS grid layout, which yes. I, was new to me. So I was just yep. curious your thoughts on that. Uh, yeah, so CSS grid layout is, I'm incredibly excited about it. And I've heard Rachel talk about it a couple times. and. Um, every time I hear her talk, I learn like nine new things. Uh, she's great. And she's been putting a lot of these resources online freely. Um, can't remember the URL, but it's like, um, if you search for Rachel Andrew grid layout, you might actually have the URL handy, but um, it's a great resource. So the thing I like about it is like, um, it's this great way of, it's this model for basically getting out of like, relying on a specific source order in our documents. And we can dramatically move elements around the page independent of where they actually sit in the HTML. Uh, so this kind of came up in uh, during lunch about like how we can reposition elements from one part of the design to the other. And right now we kind of have to use JavaScript. But grid layout is awesome because it basically is like, well, whatever. Uh, you know, this thing's that uh, you know, three, three elements off from the footer, we're just going to put it right up the top. We're going to put it up, or we're going to put it up in the right sidebar and it's maybe going to be three elements down. Um, so I'm, I'm really kind of excited about it. It's, it's one of those things where Support for it is so new. Um, and I'm a b big believer in really just diving into using those things, perhaps with a little bit of uh, progressive enhancement. So if the browser supports grid layout, let's go that way. But um, it's something that I'm still, um, I haven't really just sort of dived into yet. Yeah, yeah. So Flexbox, Flexbox is great for um, module level work. Like you can use Flexbox to dramatically change order of elements within a larger container. But folks like, um, there's this guy, Jake Archibald, who works at Google, who's basically said that that actually has some really bad or some potentially challenging uh, performance issues. If, so it's really designed for like those individual modules and sort of fine tuning the position of elements within them. Grid layout is supposed to be used kind of a level above that. We can actually um, describe in your CSS almost using that. I think that's right. I think that's right. Let me. Uh, so that's an embarrassing story. Yes, it is. Yes, it is. Yes, it is. Like latest Chrome, it's not probably not going to work too well. But um, yeah, so this is like we've been using things like floats and absolute positioning to get a little bit of independence from our source order. And this is just like next level, like rocket science stuff. Um, so this is going to be, I think, uh, the future of like page level layouts from a grid standpoint. Um, so I'm really excited to know that we're going to do this stuff. Okay, when I was sitting there listening to her talk, and it kind of reminded me when I heard you first talking about it, where I was like, okay, this is really exciting. Yeah. And then I was like, oh shit, I've got to learn this now. <laughs> 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 it's always that way. But I feel that way with a lot of things. And yeah. I'm like, oh. Right, man. right, I know. Um, I feel like it's, I mean, I only just started playing around with Flexbox in the last year, and 
even that's probably conservative by some people's standards. And I think that, I don't know, I talked to some people that are just getting into responsive design or just getting into mobile anything now, and they feel like they're catching up. And I, I feel like there's so many things to be working on and so many things we can kind of dive into that I think, you know, there's always going to be time to work on this stuff. Um, but I'm excited to work with this. It's, it's pretty great. Yeah, yeah. Kind of. Oh, great. Where they tested the old syntax versus the new syntax. And mm. the old syntax is the one with the performance. Oh, interesting. Interesting. The new syntax has no performance in that whatsoever. Cool. And um, they have the numbers. There's a number of syntax metrics. OK, well. great. Um, I'll check that out. The stuff I've done with yeah. this box, I haven't experienced any. Yeah. I haven't either, and, but I'm, I'm usually using it for that fit and finish work, like on those teaser elements. Um, and that's what I found is really helpful for. But yeah, that's good to know. I'll check out that article. That's great. Cool. And thanks for the, thanks for the grid reminder. That's good stuff. Um, I just wanted to kind of ask, I'm a bit of a greenhorn when it comes to responsive web. I know HTML, CSS, and little to none of JavaScript. Sure. And I guess, are there any tips for somebody starting out that's new or any resources that they should look into? Um, yeah, I mean, first, first thing I might say is like you're kind of a, among a room full of people that are still figuring this stuff out right now. I mean, I mean, the way I've been working over the last like two months is dramatically different than a year ago. So I think you're you're hitting this at just the right time. Um, in terms of uh, some resources that might be handy, um, I think w so. Um, I have some like less diplomatic rants about like CSS frameworks sometimes, uh, like Bootstrap or Foundation. Um, I use them for prototyping work a lot. Um, I also think they're great learning tools. Um, so if you're looking to build like a responsive design or you're just getting into CSS for the first time, I would totally get into you know I would totally check out those. Um, you know, build a layout, see what works for you, and maybe get under the hood a little bit and sort of see why things work. Um, I mean, the, the only reason I learned how web layouts work is like I viewed source in my browser and you know tried to break things a little bit, copied and pasted and coded. Um, and then, uh, yeah, I think um, CSS Tricks is a really wonderful resource. And um, I'm trying to think. You know, back in the day, I would have said like the CSS Discuss mailing list because that was another really great resource for me. I don't know if there's an equivalent out there today. Um, yeah, I would start with CSS Tricks. I think that's probably the largest sort of like community around front-end development that I know about. Uh, yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah, sure. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Um, the one thing I always advise, like, folks uh, getting started, is something I've, I'm really bad at remembering how to do, is, like, if you don't, if you have a blog, or if you don't have a blog, maybe start one. Like, just, like, even just sharing some of your process, like, and that's, that's a great way to kind of point people to something you're working on, and maybe something you're stuck on. Or maybe if you solve a problem, like, I'd love to read about it. I'd love to, like, maybe learn a different way of thinking about things. So, um, or hit me up on Twitter. I'd love to see what you're working on. Right. So, yeah. Yeah, we're all we're all figuring this out right now. So, thanks. That's great. Hi, Katie. Hi. Hi. Um, what are some of your favorite non-web books that you've read recently? Yeah. Uh, thank you. That's a great question. Um, I've been on a weird historical fiction kick, which is not something I ever thought I would say. But uh, I read um, I read Wolf Hall a couple years ago, uh, which is uh, about Thomas Cromwell and the court of Henry VIII. I know, stick with me for a second. I'm not trying to get all medieval times on you or anything. Wolf Hall, like Hall with a wolf in it. Um, it's, um, it's beautiful writing. Um, it's structurally really interesting. Like, 
the, the author's got this really bad, uh, or this, this interesting instinct that when she's got like 50 views of Thomas in a room talking to each other, she never really calls any one of them out in particular, so it's always he said, he said, he said. Got a little disorienting and weird for the first like 20 pages, but afterwards it's like, it was almost like a really beautifully written like fever dream. Like you just kind of, you know, sort of like falling through the book. Um, I thought that was great, and it's, 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 it's really stunning writing. I would totally recommend it. Uh, Williams Gibson, uh, William Gibson's The Peripheral, I read last year. Um, super fun read. Um, it's one of my favorite William Gibson books. And I'm reading this book right now called Hild, like Hilda, without the A. Um, and Griffith, and that, that's amazing. This uh, early life of this English student in the like early, uh, early Middle Ages. And I never thought really like reading anything about like you know historical fiction ever, but it's it's really great stuff. It's it's stunning writing. I would totally recommend it. Thank you. That's, I'd love to hear what you're reading later. Yeah. Yeah, bring it on. Um, so as long as we're uh, stepping away from the millions of glowing dots in front of us, um, where's the most beautiful place that you've ever been? New Zealand. New Zealand, yeah. Um, I was there for a conference three years ago, 2012. And uh, it was hard to leave. It was beautiful. I mean, I spent like 10 days there, just drove around, didn't see any one place nearly enough. Had some of the best coffee I've ever had in my life, and uh, it's just stunning countryside. Um, yeah, I could have spent like a month or two there. It was really great. So, yeah, if you ever get a chance to go, I would totally jump at it. So, yeah. Thank you. Thank you. I didn't really think about a question. So, okay. Th thank you for writing that book, because <laughs> honestly, like as a designer and where I was at that point in time when the book came out, it like, kind of just blew my mind. And, you know, I was, I was like, I was aware of the DAO web design and everything, but like nothing ever clicked of like, yeah, the flexibility of the, the web. Yeah. And how it is just this infinite canvas. And like, it was, it was like actually seeing media queries and examples in the book. It was like, oh my gosh, this is incredible. <laughs> and I was just like, just blown away and, and my entire, perspective and everything about how I designed websites changed. Oh, that's nice um, of you to say. So, it, yeah, thank you. Thank you. That's, that's, thank you. I appreciate that. Do you have any funny Zeldman stories? <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm only a three and a half hour train ride from New York, so I don't know if I want to incur, <laughs> incur his wrath or anything, but uh, yeah, yeah. Anyone else have any questions? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> there is one question yeah. in the doc that's got mm. 40 upvotes now. <clears throat> okay, wow. Um, I'll just read it directly. Where do you get that fly blazer? <laughs> <laughs> uh, oh, this is a Banana Republic special. All right, you know? yeah. excellent, yeah. excellent. Yeah. Anyway, yeah. I'm not going to run away for you folks, but uh, <laughs> yeah. Uh, thank, thank you for the 40 upvotes. <laughs> I'm going to, I'll read a few more here, and if mm. these spur other conversation, you know, jump in, okay, everybody, but yeah. um, I love this. What, if anything, do you miss about pre-responsive websites? Huh. Uh, man, now dealing with Android, I think would probably be my, uh, um, I mean, I, I love Android, I love a lot of things about it, but like it's, it's like the, there was this great uh, presentation that came up last year. Like there is no one Android, you know. We're basically like because of like how open it is and how customizable it is. A lot of uh, carriers have done things to it from a browser standpoint and from other standpoints. But from a browsing standpoint, that is like um, actually I'll show you one of my uh, one of my favorite tweets ever. Um, let's see. Yeah. Okay. Let's see if this is still online. Okay, so both of these Android browsers have the same WebKit version number. One of them doesn't support web fonts. So these are effectively, these are the same browser, same exact version of Android. They both should support web fonts, but because of some customization that's happened uh, before it actually got onto that particular device from that carrier or from that vendor, uh, one of them is a completely different browser. Um, so there's a, there was a great presentation kind of diving into a lot more of these challenges kind of like last year, but um, I'm, I'm not c making a crack on Android. I'm, I, I want more browsers in the marketplace more than anything, but like the interesting edge cases in my work, you know, I, um, 
tend to come up with some of these weird little unforeseen variations where you might have a browser that says it supports web fonts, for example, doesn't actually support web fonts. So how do you deal with that? Um, so again, I'm, I'm a big fan of Android and everything that it's trying to do. And actually, some of the best UI work that's happening on mobile right now is coming out of Google. Um, but you know, this is where my job gets kind of interesting around the edges. Um, so yeah, very pro Android, but <laughs> cool. it, more browsers than ever before is the thing that I would not miss if I had to go back to 1990 something. Yeah. Um, yeah. When you wrote the responsive web design article, and probably when you presented at an event apart that year, yeah, uh, you were very, very specific in defining, you know, responsive web design and mm. the three core components, right? Yeah. Um, was there some foresight that you had in sort of the power of a name and a, de a clear definition? Yeah. Um, that you feel like aided in the fire that kind of caught mm. with that, right. or was that happenstance? Or <laughs> yeah. Uh, that's interesting. Um, I got, so I got a, I, I did the talk, and Mandy Brown, who was working at an event apart at the time, or working at a list apart at the time, and she went on to co-found a book apart. She invited me to write the article. She was like, "This this is an interesting approach. We should totally have this on the magazine." And then when the article kind of blew up, it turned into the book. Um, but it wasn't any foresight. It was really about like we've always been able to build flexible layouts, but now we, maybe we can have some that are less terrible, and we could actually like shape them in interesting ways. So. At least for me, it was always about like the marriage of those those two things, like flexible layouts and media queries together. Um, yeah, so the it's interesting you said like very prescriptive because I I kind of felt like I was actually kind of keeping things broad, I guess, because um, you can build a responsive site that is 50 megabytes too heavy, or maybe isn't built with progressive enhancement, or maybe it just sort of assumes that. You know, some technology is always going to work flawlessly. So there, there, I think there's a distinction between responsive design and maybe a well-built responsive design. So at least in my mind, like I think re, you know, flexible layouts and media queries, like that's a that's a foundation, and a lot of like refinement and craft can happen on top of that, hopefully. So yeah, rather than saying a responsive design has to meet these 58 criteria to be good, I'd like to start with like let's design responsively as much as possible, and then sort of see what the best practices are from there. I don't know. Yeah. Do you have Do you have tips for aspiring writers uh, <clears throat> in terms of uh, Yeah. Just the difficulty of getting words down. Getting words down. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, a couple. I mean, I, <laughs> I'm standing in front of you guys. I haven't touched my blog in about a year, and I feel I always feel bad about that. Um, I talked to uh, Matt Griffiths at uh, Bearded, and he basically said like. He has to kind of treat the first two hours every day as like his time or his writing time, and like do that before he actually gets into email and gets into the road of like the, you know, the routine of his day, um, and actually just set it aside for writing. So I think finding the time of day that's best for you, whether it's like three in the morning or, you know, ten o'clock in the morning um, or ten at night, um, and setting that aside for you is what's really key, and that's something I'm terrible at doing. Um, yeah, and then I don't know, like finding a place where you can actually be offline and be present when you're actually writing. That's that's really helpful for me, I think, in general. So, yeah, yeah, that's all I got. Cool. What other questions? I got a question. Nice. Do you find it? Well, <coughs> Karen McGrain. Yeah. Every single episode of your podcast, she's got a fire truck coming through her living room. <laughs> <laughs> so you need to get a sound booth for her or something like right, that. Right, you need to get some right. like, foam core or something. That's yeah, super no, she. Uh, cause that's really funny. Uh, great audio. <laughs> yeah, no, no, we um, <coughs> we both have microphones that are uh, kind of known for being a little bit hot when it comes to background noise. And uh, I live on a quiet street in you know just outside Boston. She lives in like downtown Manhattan. Um, but uh, it's funny because our audio editor finally just said to her, like, do you have a closet? <laughs> or just, so, and so it's actually, it's, it's really funny because the last like 10 episodes or so, maybe not quite that many, but like seven or eight episodes, her sound quality is just, it's way above mine now. Like she sounds amazing. Uh, but she is, you know, in a very tiny room, seated in her, yeah, it's in, but it's, it's really high quality stuff. So uh, that's really funny, thanks. That's great. Anything else? Yeah. Um, what are your thoughts on the 
apps versus web, sure. where like you know people, everyone says apps are all the hotness and the web is dead, mm. all that kind of stuff. What are your thoughts on that? Yeah, um, I mean I think the web is anything but dead, um, or and I, it's not just because like I have a bit of a web practice, but um, you know I think that. Um, there's been some interesting data kind of coming out of like Morgan Stanley right now and a couple other like uh, Forrester had a public um, had a study that came out a couple weeks ago about how mobile web usage has been dramatically underestimated because so much of it is actually happening in native applications um, you know in social media clients for example that's kind of like the big one um, and you know I mentioned earlier, like 25% of like the mobile web traffic is believed to be coming from like Facebook and Twitter inside of their applications. Um, so yeah, I don't think the web is dead or anything. I think it's maybe moving a little bit out of like s solely just the browser. Um, but uh, yeah, that's kind of where I've landed right now. Um, and especially like, uh, you know, for developing markets, which I've been working with a lot more recently, um, you know, focusing on these like really heavy native applications kind of limits their reach a little bit. Um, so that's been kind of an interesting design challenge for me. It's like, how can we think about like a web first responsive front end that might actually end up in a native application at some point? Uh, so yeah. Yeah. Another one. Oh, cool. yeah. yeah. You were a genie in a bottle, which we all know you are. <laughs> <laughs> and you could future cast and say like five years from now, you're doing the same kind of talk. Right. What, what do you think we'll be talking about? What do you think we'll be presenting? Huh. Yeah, I'm not a futurist. If I, I don't know, Karen McGrain likes to say if she was a futurist and she could predict where the industry was going to be in five years, she wouldn't be doing presentations. <laughs> um, I don't know. I mean, it's like, yeah, I don't know what the next new thing is going to be. I mean, like, folks were mad about smart TVs and Google Glass last year, and now it's kind of emphasis on what's going to happen with smartwatches. Um, and uh, in-car browsing is another thing that a lot of folks are getting kind of excited about. But... I guess the thing I'm more interested in is like, what are some design principles and practices we can talk about as an industry that are going to sort of survive the devices in front of us, you know, and think a little bit more like, you know, we're building these interfaces that maybe last six months to 18 months, if we're lucky, you know, where are we investing in the future? Like, you know, what is going to actually survive those interfaces or survive those devices in front of us? Um, so that's, that's kind of what I'm hoping more people are going to start talking about is less less just about like CSS layout and a little bit more about like best practices for digital design in general across more devices. So, yeah, I'm gonna think about that more. That's a really good question. Yeah. Yeah. Right. <laughs> I think I'm going to start, and that'll be a uh, yeah. Um, I think the thing I um, I don't really see myself as like uh, any more of an authority on responsive design than anybody else here. Like I'm just I'm, I, I really see myself as like a practicing designer, and you know I I wrote an article that um, I'm really fortunate was as popular as it was, and turned into a book that. A lot of folks said some very nice things about, but like, I'm, I'm like I'm really trying to figure out stuff alongside you folks, um, and I've worked on maybe a couple more responsive designs than some, but like, there's always going to be something new and terrible about the web. Um, so, yeah. Well, yeah, no, that that could be, but um, I think what I what I try to do, and this isn't just because of the responsive design thing. This is just like I'm more. The people that have always like appealed to me in the response or in like the web design in general, they've always been generous with whatever part of the stage they have, you know. So they're always trying to like elevate other voices and trying to bring more people into the discussion, rather than saying that I am the authority on this. I'm always going to be more interested in trying to find people that are connecting me with other inter people doing interesting work. So I try to do that in a little little bit on like the responsive design Twitter account. Like I want to talk about not just cool redesigns that I see that other people have worked on, but like people talking about some of these challenges. Because um, I think the, the industry's got too many challenges in front of it to 
dedicate its attention on just a couple voices. We have a lot of big challenges in front of us now, and we're going to have more coming in the future. And um, if we're only listening to like three or four people, um, we're going to be uh, we're going to have a whole mess of problems. Um, and then, so that's why, and you know, a total sidebar. Like that's why I've been really excited about like this. Um, the emphasis on inclusivity in web design in general over the last like year, so like code of conduct work that you know I was really excited to see Sparkbox had. Like, I want to hear from more people from more backgrounds because if we're really just focusing on a certain demographic to answer some of these problems, we're going to be missing out a whole bunch of other issues. So, um, so I think you know, uh, for the work that you're doing in responsive design, like elevate other voices, like try to find other people and tell me about them, uh, tell other people about them. Um, be a reader rather than a speaker, I guess, is what I try to be. So I really appreciate you asking that question. What th that was great. Yeah. Uh, more question is, um, just want to add a comment from uh, this question over there about what's happening five years from now. Mm. Uh, during the break, I was talking with Andy over there um, about this subject. And one of the things I see probably happening in five years or so just whatever number, but it's um, just like today we talk about uh, using tables for layouts, using one pixel <coughs> to view with layouts in some way. Right. In five years from now, I see that we are maybe probably going to be talking about media queries for layout. Remember the day when we had to use media queries? Well, now right. at that point, we might not use yeah. media queries. Sure. We have Flexbox can be coming, uh, <coughs> you know, even more popular than it is now. Yeah. We have the CSS grids coming in. Um, so a lot of those new CSS features are going to have even more support. Sure. Making media queries less, <coughs> making our work less dependent mm. on media queries. Like yeah. That's just kind of what I'm No, that's, an, that's a really interesting point. Um, and I think that's right. I think that like in broad strokes, I think like there's always going to be better support for some of these newer tools, and it's probably going to allow us to kind of reevaluate some of the things we've just sort of taken to be known. Um, you know, in a lot of ways, like responsive design for me was kind of like a Trojan horse to get people excited about flexible design. Um, but it also made it valuable for me in a way that like it wasn't before. Like I could actually start thinking about a flexible layout that was actually adapting in useful ways rather than just like, oh, well, this sprawly thing is just terrible. Um, so there's probably going to be something that actually allows us to build more broadly, more effectively than responsive design does. And that'll be great. Um, sure, sure. Um, the interesting trend that I'm kind of seeing in general on the web and, or, and more specifically my practice is like there's always going to be that forward march to adoption of better standards and better layout. but the other thing that's happening is like um, most of the growth that's happening in the web right now isn't happening in developed markets. You know, the next billion people to come online aren't going to be coming from the United States or from Eastern, uh, Western Europe. They're going to be coming from Sub-Saharan Africa, Southeast Asia, and they're going to be on these devices that are, um, you know, far less powerful and far cheaper than, you know, you and I might use on a daily basis. So I'm always kind of interested about the web that's getting both better and faster and stronger but at the same time getting more broadly accessed and slower and cheaper. So how can we design for both ends of that spectrum? Um, and, and I think that's, yeah. Yeah, exactly. And I think that if we can keep both of those poles in our mind, um, we're going to be better set up for whatever ends up happening. Knock on wood. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. That's a great question. A couple more from the doc. Nice. Um, Opinions, thoughts on um, sites or concepts like the grid.io? Man, I've been getting a lot of questions <laughs> about the grid.io. Has anyone used it? Anyone? No? Yeah? <laughs> oh, all right, all right. Got a little fire coming up. Um, yeah, I've been hearing a lot of talk about it, but I haven't actually talked to anybody who's, who's using it on a product right now. Um, so I don't know, I guess I'm probably as concerned as the next person that robots are going to replace us at some point. Yeah. But, um, you know, there have been applications and tools in the past that have been kind of promoted to solve some of these problems, and they, they haven't killed the industry yet. Um, I am interested in, like, you know, algorithmic layout design. I mean, like, Flipboard talked a lot about that when they actually sort of, like, came up with their new layout engine for um, 
uh, for their client uh, for Flipboard. Uh, Vox Media does a lot of that, so they can actually algorithmically score different variations on layout, so they can actually sort of, you know, come up with something that's going to be the most engaging layout possible given certain content types. So I think it's going to be like a combination of, I'm hopeful that there's going to be a combination of machine-driven and human-driven approaches to thinking about some of these problems. So uh, we'll see what happens. So but. what if we dial that back a little bit to something like Squarespace mm. or Wix? Um, yeah. Thoughts on how that's impacting the industry? <laughs> Yeah, I mean, there have been there are people more qualified than I to talk about products like that, like because um, I think it has affected a, a market for design at a certain tier. They made design accessible to a whole class of people that it wasn't before, and I think that's a wonderful thing. Um, but there were also probably a lot of people doing work for that part of the market that might not be now. So, um, but I think yeah, from Squarespace does some really beautiful, stunning work, and I think that it's really great to see. But you know, my kid's sister just got out of design school and was able to fire up a quick Wix site, and that's, that's awesome, yeah. you know? Um, so I think there's, there's always going to be a negotiation, right? Sure. So, yeah. Okay. But yeah. Another one here, um, comments around the idea of sort of writing your CSS with JavaScript, which tends to be sort of, is a new trend these days. Yep. Um, mentioning React and some of the others that are encouraging that kind of uh, approach. Yeah. Um, I, I don't have a direct, any direct experience with some of the new hot MVC frameworks. I've, I've used um, things like Backbone. Editorially, was built on Backbone. Um, used mustache templates on the client and on the server side. Um, yeah, I don't know. I think like uh, most of the progressive enhancement folks that I kind of follow and kind of look up to, they're actually kind of excited about React in a lot of ways because it does kind of lend itself to that server side rendering. Um, some probably some old part of me is like, why would you do that uh, from the J CSS and JavaScript thing? But uh, if it solves a need, if it solves a problem, awesome. Yeah. 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 Cool. yeah. Yeah, that's a great, thanks for asking that. That's, um, I think the, the amount of time I spend on either design or development depends on the product or the project. So, you know, I'm, I'm comfortable stepping into either a design lead role or a UI lead role. Um, I, think, I think every visual designer should have some understanding of page layout. Um, just like I think every developer should have some understanding of good typography, you know, what a well-formed grid looks like. Um, because in every responsive project I've worked on, it's like they kind of live or die based on how collaboratively those two halves can work together. And so like if I, as a design lead, can sketch out some ideas for how a layout might work, like if that gets the idea across more quickly, that's awesome. Uh, or vice versa, if I'm on the uh, UI side and uh, I make some recommendations and a prototype for how a, a breakpoint might reflow or how the layout might adapt at certain points, that gives the designer some uh, some point of something, something they can uh, give feedback on, or maybe refine a little bit more if it's not working out that well. So, I d I'm never going to look to hire somebody who's, you know, equally awesome in both. I'm definitely not. But like, if somebody can knows enough of the other discipline to kind of get their idea across, that's what I really want to work with. Um, so yeah, thanks. That's a great question. Thanks for watching the Build Right Maker series. Check out our other videos from industry leaders at buildright.io, or even better, buy a ticket and attend in person.